everybody you know i always say this whenever i think continuing conversations can't get any better um we we have guests accept our invitation to come on and continue the conversation about all things star trek adventures and now captain's log included in that i'm michael dismuke i am a blogger on continuing missions which is the number one site for star trek adventures and i'm going to say captain's log for now i think we can hold this ranking since 2018 i'm also a freelance writer for star trek adventures rpg and it's fantastic of course to have my wonderful co-host with us today jim johnson uh, hey everybody jim johnson i'm the project manager and line editor for the star trek adventures rpg and the captain's log solo rpg both published by modifius entertainment uh going on seven plus years strong now co-host on this here show with michael dismuke going on two years now which is super exciting and uh, yeah michael i guess we're gonna have to start uh, uh changing our intros because it's not just sta anymore it's sta and captain's log because captain's log i mean really it's it's its own thing Right, it's picking fact, up. Yeah, we were, we were talking about this internally in Modifius the other day. We were like, uh, you know, Captain's Log, because we were trying to think about how to present it to people, and like, it's not really a supplement to STA. It's it's its own thing. It's it's it's, it's separate but related. So it, um, it's actually two. We're, we're responsible for two games now. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's it's some people are making amalgamations of it, but we'll talk more. We could talk more about that in in other episodes. Okay. Yeah. But we we really got to go ahead, Jim. You got to introduce our our yeah. our guest today because I'm so excited. Uh, we're going to introduce a, a new writer to the Star Trek Adventures uh, writer's room. I don't want to say stable because that just sounds insulting. Uh, but the, the writer's room uh, continues to grow and expand at Star Trek Adventures. I'm always super excited to bring in uh, new writers, uh, whether brand new writers or experienced writers who just want to write for the line, who love Star Trek, etc. So we've got um, uh, Michael Duxbury with us tonight uh, or this evening or whatever you, whenever you're watching the show. And uh, Michael, we'd love for you to introduce yourself. And uh, as part of our tradition here on the show, we always ask our guests to uh, tell us which your favorite star trek series is and who your favorite captain is so whatever order you want to take those in go for it okay uh i'll start the introduction uh i'm michael duxbury as you said um i am a freelance writer and rpg uh designer i've worked on a, a great many uh game lines uh that you might have heard of uh many of the warhammer rpgs uh the one ring rpg uh, some of my own self-published content as well uh, the One More Quest RPG, but obviously most relevant to this. I've um, been doing a few uh, jobs for Modifius, uh, mostly so far for the Star Trek Adventures RPG and my collection of mission briefs. Uh, the the um, uh, Starfleet Academy set uh, has recently been released and is available for download uh, at whatever uh, price you choose to pay. Um, and I'm very excited to be on the show and talk about that and talk about Star Trek and talk about RPGs in general. Um, as far as uh, favorite captain, favorite series, um, how did I not anticipate this question and have an answer prepared? I've no idea. Um, I think uh, favorite captain, um, it's hard to beat John Luke Picard. Um, there's lots of uh, really fantastic captains that I think really work as characters and that I'm really excited for their journey. But I think as far as, you know, Starfleet captains, you know what you expect of a Starfleet captain? That's Picard. Um, and uh, I love The Next Generation. Um, I love the original series. But uh, let's say uh, Next Generation is my favorite series as well. On the okay. back of the uh, esteemed Patrick Stewart. <laughs> awesome. I sense that in your writing, too. I want to say what my yeah. first introduction to you were, Michael, was I picked up, um, started playtesting in late 2017, 2018, and Modifius issue number two, you had written a short mission called Ghost Writer, which I have to say, when it comes up with conversations with the hundreds of people I talk to about Star Trek Adventure, um, it comes up as one of the favorites every time someone plays it. And it was such a real TNG episode. I have to give it to you um, because it was not a pew pew battle at all. It was a very philosophical rights of the hologram kind of thing. I won't give any more spoilers about that. Um, but I have to say that my group, which included at that time a teenager from the UK, in fact, um, who was playing with us, it was so nice to see the age range. I think he was 14, 15 at the time. And then we went all the way playing up into the 60s. He was so riveted by that story. 
And I was like, wow, this is Star Trek Adventure. So I got to give it to you. You are our very first super emotive game um, that we played. Um, and I had always been looking for you to do more since then. So I was so happy. Um, you also wrote, you know, the one in Strange New Worlds. Um, uh, I don't think that was me. I can't remember uh, who the writer of that one is. I'm not maybe, in Strange New Worlds. Okay, I'll, <laughs> che I'll check. But anyways, we were waiting for you to do more. And so I was yeah. so happy when Starfleet Academy came out um, yeah. on it. So so glad to have you uh, giving us at least 10 new missions to work on. <laughs> for sure. Thank you. That's, that's very kind. Uh, I mean, the Ghostwriter, which, as you say, was um, something that I wrote for Medifia magazine, uh, a, a di digital e-sign that Medifia has put out for a little while. Um, yeah, in Medifia issue three, it was just like a, a another short adventure that I put to, uh, together for that, uh, which, as you say, was something that was trying to drive a more uh, philosophical, emotional side of Star Trek, which is the side of Star Trek that I'm most excited about. Um, and yeah, there are references to specific TNG episodes in that, so I'm, oh, yeah. I'm not surprised that it came across as something that uh, uh, had that kind of uh my own preferences of star trek came to the fore through that okay yeah it showed it showed so that's super cool and then just one last thing about your writing style your style of writing is actually super interesting too and i saw it carry over into starfleet academy um so i have to compliment you that when i look at your writing style look at your blog sometimes so anyone wanting to check him out uh should definitely check out his website at michaelduxbury.com uh because you get a more flavor into your talent so glad to have you here today Thank you. Very kind. <laughs> so I have to I have to ask, um, I'm curious, uh, you know, getting on Star Trek for just a moment, because I'm sure we'll talk more about Star Trek here in a few minutes. But uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience with uh, working on the uh, the One Ring RPG. Uh, I don't know if you can if you can see my shelf behind me. This is all Tol Tolkien uh, right here. And <laughs> I've got all the One Ring stuff on another shelf over there. And um, I, I am I'm a little jealous that you've been able to work on both Star Trek and Lord of the Rings uh, recent, uh, you know, the recent incarnations. Uh, yeah. Back in the day, I was a, I was a, um, a playtest coordinator and a freelance writer on uh, Decipher's Lord of the Rings RPG. And um, back in 2018, 2019, somewhere right before the pandemic, I was at Gen Con and I had an opportunity to meet up with uh, Francisco Nepitello and uh, wow. just talking about because they, they were about to transition from cubicle seven to somewhere else. Right. And he was looking for some help. And, uh, at the time I just, I couldn't commit because I knew I was going to get the, the job as the project manager on, um, on Star Trek. And it was really hard to, to, to balance between, do I want to work on Tolkien or do I want to work on Star Trek and Star Trek's my first love, but, uh, I'm super excited that you've been able to work on both of them. And I was just wondering if you, if you could talk just a little bit about your, uh, experiences with Tolkien, what led you to working on the one ring and, uh, and how's it been working out for you? Yeah, I really did get to have my cake and eat it going to work on uh, both RPGs. I can't imagine being put into uh, your situation where you had to choose between the two. Um, I have uh, a working relationship with Cubicle 7 that uh, goes back a, a good few years now. Um, uh, you know, here in the UK, uh, Warhammer was a huge part of my childhood. Um, and obviously Cubicle 7 have all the Warhammer RPGs now. So, so I've, I've been uh, following that for a while. But before uh, Cubicle 7 had any of the Warhammer RPG licenses, um, they were putting out the One Ring, um, which uh, I thought was an absolutely phenomenal game. Um, really uh, one of those uh, 2010s RPGs that started blending elements of story gaming and traditional role playing together in new and really interesting ways. Uh, Francesco is a phenomenal designer. Um, I, I don't usually go in for like the really big, huge uh, strategy board games, uh, but his work on the War of the Ring uh, RP, uh, War of the Ring board game, much like the One Ring, is just oozing um, with flavor for, for the, the world of Tolkien and Middle Earth, and uh, it's a hugely impressive design. Um, I uh, it's funny because uh, through Warhammer, in a way, uh, I got really into uh, Lord of the Rings and Adolescence because Games Workshop were doing Lord of the Rings miniatures game as well as doing uh, Warhammer miniatures. Um, and between that and obviously the, the landmark trilogy uh, by Peter Jackson, um, I got really into Tolkien. Um, some of my very, very earliest uh, game design credits uh, were when I was uh, uh, an adolescent writing uh, things for the little love battle of five armies miniatures game played at tiny Warmaster epic scale um that the specialist games arm of games workshop put out on their website 
Um, and I suspect maybe it was those early credits I had with Games Workshop that inspired um, Cubicle 7 to take a chance on me, um, to give me an opportunity to work on the One Ring uh, when they put an open call for writers. Um, but then sadly, that was for the second edition of the game, uh, which for uh, numerous reasons that I wasn't involved with at all, uh, didn't come to come to be. Um, and ultimately, the, the line moved across uh, from Cubicle 7 to uh, Free League, um, who are another RPG publisher I admire a great deal. Um, and then I was able to get in touch with Francesco and say, hey, you know, I, I have experience writing for the One Ring because I did all this stuff for Cubicle 7. Sadly, it's not going to come out, but is there an opportunity uh, to write maybe a stretch goal for the Kickstarter that you're putting together? Um, and as well as the uh, the core book and the starter set, the Free League guys have put out a really great guide to... Uh, I guess you'd call them dungeons, but the, the, the landmarks as, as Free League do them in their games like Forbidden Lands are a very specific kind of dungeon in terms of how you approach them and, and uh, they're not conventional adventure design. And I really enjoyed engaging with that challenge of working out weird, abandoned, uh, deserted, haunted locales in the wilds of Northern Middle Earth and working out ways to take parts of the world that hadn't been much explored before and make them interesting places for the player characters to go um in I, a way yeah. sorry go ahead no 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 please go ahead in a way i was go gonna ahead. say in, in, in a way that theme of characters going into somewhere unknown and, and exploring it which i think was a real angle that uh free league wanted to uh to, to push the one ring rather than it being a sightseeing tour to your favorite locations from the movies um th that resonates again with things i really like about star trek where you know one of the things that makes that setting uh, so entrancing for an RPG is you've got an entire universe to play in, um, strange new worlds where you can go and uncover anything and, and something brand new. And, and I think that's always extremely fertile ground for an RPG. Awesome. Yeah. So I like that you said you, you've you been writing. It sounds like you're prolific even at a very young age writing. And I want to talk about that because many times me and Jim have talked in shows are like, well, how do you get into RPG writing? What do you do? And and. Talk us a lot about that journey. Um, you know, did you discover someone? Did they discover you? But give us an idea of how young you were when you really started writing, um, how you showcased your work and to get to where you are now. For sure. So as I said, some of my very earliest experiences were with Games Workshop's uh, specialist uh, games line, uh, Battle of Five Armies, uh, Necromunda. Uh, I played loads of the Inquisitor War game when uh, I was a kid, which was a real gateway between... 40k war game and 40k rpg content um and all of that stuff was just I, i'd write up things at you know it's hugely in, excited and enthusiastic about that in the way you only can be when you're an adolescent um firing that across without any expectation of being paid whatsoever and just being thrilled to see that then up up on the site and something that other people were able to enjoy as well um and then you know went to uh, university uh, got uh, plenty of opportunities to role play when I was at university, which immersed me even deeper in this hobby that I love and, and, and cherish so much. Um, and even then, I'm doing writing for my home games and doing writing in my spare time and trying to keep my blog going. But it's not really something um, that I've considered as a as a career um, at this point, um, just because uh, uh, it can be really difficult to make it uh, work a uh, career in, in freelance RPGs. The money isn't always great, and it's often difficult to get the work. Um, the opportunity to, to turn this into something that I'm doing full time, which isn't what I'm doing now, really came up about two and a half years ago, where I was offered a chance uh, to work on an RPG uh, called One More Quest, uh, which isn't out yet, uh, but uh, kickstarted uh, fairly recently. And I think the PDF has gone out to backers now. So I suspect a general release of One More Quest is, is imminent, um, which is a uh, fantasy comedy uh, dexterity game uh, RPG. Um, <laughs> dexterity? Yes, lots of like throwing dice towards targets in order to get it to land in a particular spot. And that's what you get as your score rather than what you roll on a die. But then combine that with lots of really silly throw restrictions like throwing with your eyes closed or throwing under your leg uh, or similar. Uh, it's a really fun, uh, party, lighthearted uh, comedy take on your more traditional uh, dungeon crawling fantasy uh, stuff. Um, I was uh, ha lucky enough to be approached through a friend of a friend uh, to work on that part time. 
Um, so what I've been doing for the last two and a half years is working on that game. And in the meantime, picking up freelance work wherever I can get it. Um, and that's meant a lot of work for uh, the likes of uh, Cubicle 7 on the Warhammer RPGs, like I've said, but also Modiphius uh, on their uh, Star Trek Adventures and Cohorts Cthulhu lines, uh, the latter uh, still to come. Um, and whatever else uh, I can uh, approach people and try and get them interested in my work um, by using content I've written as a freelancer or RPGs are published through self-publishing. Um, awesome. I'm always looking for more opportunities to uh, broaden out, work with new people, um, write for lots of different settings, lots of different systems. Um, I play lots of different settings and lots of different systems. So um, I approach it from the perspective of a generalist in, in that sense. Uh, there's lots of things that I'm passionate about, enough that I'm able to hopefully uh, find my place working on a great many different RPG game lines and enough to make that work as a career amazing your brain how it works just <laughs> i love it that you could switch like that <laughs> <laughs> well it's something yeah when you're doing it full time you, you do have to get quite good at compartmentalizing when you're focusing on this and when you're focusing on this um i think it's something that a lot of people can relate to if they've turned their hobby into a job uh, i know a lot of people get worried that oh, once the hobby becomes the job it stops being something you find fun i've actually found the opposite problem which is i find it difficult to stop start stop thinking about it and think about anything else and become more obsessive than ever okay i was wondering about that i was gonna ask you just that i was like do you ever like are there days where you regret like oh man i got it right yeah <laughs> there definitely are days like that uh when the, the the motivation isn't taking you or uh it, you know creatively you're feeling uh drained and, and you're feeling like you need something of relief mm -hmm. um but the, the solution in that instance is almost always to take the break. It's, it's almost always to, to, to not write, not force yourself to do it, mm -hmm. and use that as an opportunity to go outside, you know, get connect with friends, connect with nature, um, look for ideas in other media. Um, the, the worst thing you can do is, is have a life that consists solely of uh, – playing and then writing RPGs because if you're not having anything that's coming in and giving you motivation or inspiration from outside that circle, you end mm -hmm. up regurgitating old material. So yeah. yeah. Do you do that as a as a um routine or do you wait till you get to the breaking point, then go out there and do these other things to find refreshment, or do you have a pretty good zone that you work? I'm still working on finding the, the right balance of, of being able to recognize when I'm reaching that burnout and taking that break. Um, it's very important. The more I do it, the more I realize how important it is. And slowly but surely, uh, perhaps not as fa fast as uh, my wife would prefer, <laughs> I'm getting better at recognizing when that's coming up uh, and stopping short and looking for ways to take the break beforehand. Oh, good. Jim, I never even asked you that. Like, like... What do you do when you burn, get to the, I don't want to say burnout, because I don't know if you ever do, but um, what do you do on that to refresh yourself? Um, I, I just try to find ways to recharge, right? I, I'll step away from the computer, I'll step away from the work, and uh, I'll read. I like, I read a lot. I read as much as I can. Anytime I have free time, I read. I've always got my Kindle by my side. Uh, if I'm going somewhere and I know I'm going to have to wait, if I'm in a waiting line or if I'm waiting for a, a doctor's appointment or whatever, um, I've always got my Kindle with me. Uh, even I mean, I, I even do it sometimes when I'm sitting in traffic. Like if I know I've got to go pick up um, a family member or if I'm going to be in traffic for a while, you know, even at a red light, 10, 15 minutes, if it's going to be a long break, I can just read a couple of pages on the Kindle, right? And just keep feeding my brain with story, uh, watching TV, watching movies, uh, reading books, reading comic books, reading the news, like literally anything. I just try to ingest just as much stuff as possible because all of that stuff is um, story material, right? Stuff I can bend, fold and spindle into a story, whether it's Star Trek or something else. Uh, but for, I mean, speaking for specifically for Star Trek, like over the last seven years, there's been a couple of points where I, I knew I was getting close to burnout um because uh, there's a period of time there were like it, it was pretty much me right like doing all the star trek work um all the all the project management all the business type stuff it was mostly me <laughs> doing a lot of that and uh because we had NDAs and stuff like there was stuff that we were working on that I couldn't share with most of my freelancers uh, because we were trying to keep it, you know, even though you all are under NDAs too, I had to keep it compartmentalized at some point to some point because we didn't want to announce everything yet. And I didn't want to announce something 
and then have everybody saying, oh, I'd love to work on that. I'd love to work on that. I'd love to work on that. Because like, I know you want to work on it. I, I get that. But I don't I just don't need the extra 30 to 40 emails, um, you know, pressure on top of everything else. Right. Um, so there was a couple of times where I was getting burned out and or getting close to it. And what I would do is I would just unplug from the work and just go, you know, live life and be with my family and, uh, uh, you know, get outside a bit. And um, what I found what I found really recharging, though, was to um, was to go online and to find the Twitch streams and the YouTube videos and the blogs and just all the people discussing and enjoying the game outside of Modiphius, like just seeing what they were doing with the game out there in the wide, wide world was so inspiring because that that kind of helped me realize that, you know, we're not just making product and we're not just, you know, selling Star Trek stuff. We're, we're actually being able to reach people so that they can unlock their creativity and tell amazing Star Trek stories. And that's a huge reward for me that that really lifted me up. I was like, Oh, Oh, it's not just it's not just, you know, we're not I mean, obviously, most of us on the Star Trek in any way, we're not chasing a paycheck. We're not doing this for the money. <laughs> obviously, we're doing it for the love. You know, there is there's not a lot of money in the RPG industry. And you know, Michael, you alluded to that, Michael Duxbury, you alluded to that. Um, not to say that we're, you know, not getting paid, but, uh, you know, we're not, none of us are getting rich off of, the, <laughs> off of working on this. Right. And that's okay. Right. Because we, we love the property. And, and for me, the richness is in being able to make these amazing products and sharing them with the people and then seeing what they do with it. Right. That's the, that's the feedback loop that I'm really enjoying. Like, especially right now with the lower decks and captain's log hitting the, hitting the, uh, the world right now is like, whoa, there's people out there creating captain's log stories that, wouldn't probably would not have existed had that game not come out had had not we all put that effort into making it and and that's a that's a huge gift for me right because I, I get to read more stories now right and it's awesome yeah. so you um, get motivated by the product which is cool me i'm like i'm gonna play rpg anyway so i am also get paid to do it fine <laughs> <laughs> either way it's like yeah. believe me I'm, if we were to count all the years probably we've all played our rpg we are in a deficit of <laughs> when it comes to that of getting paid and, yeah. and then i wanted to talk a little bit you know once we get refreshed and motivated we get back into it um there's something about i'd like to ask you michael about how you construct a game because i read through the starfleet academy mission briefs again they were not predictable i was like oh this is going to be like this and like that they were not predictable at all so i kind of want to get into your head and think about your creative process since you are so prolific but um it, even in one mission brief pack, you came out as very uh, a big variety of, of different styles of play and different stories. So how do you do that? What do you what's what do you do to get there? Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Um, you, you know, I, I, I wrote a blog post about this for uh, Modifius website, uh, touching on this a little bit. Like uh, the original ideas I had for for working on Starfleet Academy were not necessarily what then came into the finished product. Um, because it was the, the original prompt of Starfleet uh, Academy as something that we wanted to do a series of uh, briefs about was one I actually got from Jim. And what then went into the uh, finished product was something that was then entirely left at my discretion, at least for the initial pitch. And originally I had ideas for, okay, well, within this theme, is there room for stories where characters are guest speakers and they have to prepare a presentation is there room for people to take over as acting principal of the academy or something uh to stumble across uh cadets out in space that they have to get home to the academy you know there's, there's, there's loads of different uh, ways in which you can approach that theme but similar to what jim alluded to earlier what i find most inspiring what i find most motivational is content that can then be used at the game table content that can be used for people to play games with there's nothing i find quite as demoralizing as a game book which gets purchased and then just goes and sits on a shelf somewhere and then never gets actually used at a game table because what we're in this for is, is the stories that you create when you put those games in front of your friends so it was from that uh angle that i was thinking okay how can i make the the theme of starfleet academy work at a table w what is the niche that this product can fill and it was from there that i got the idea of stringing to the the 10 stories together as a complete story of a student a cadet going through starfleet academy now the premise of the mission briefs is that they can always work as standalone stories if you drop into your campaign uh, they can always work in whatever order you want to do them. That they're not intended to be run as campaigns in, in the same way that uh, some campaign books are. And that's absolutely true. 
uh, Starfleet Academy as, as a set of mission briefs. It's something that uh, the Star Trek system really benefits from with its supporting character system is you can always just add another cadet aboard the ship and you can have some adventures uh, with them for a while, maybe as flashbacks, maybe as uh, lead up to them featuring as main characters in your campaign. But especially if you're new to Star Trek Adventures, if you're looking for an angle into the world uh, that is slowly introducing you to, to those concepts, that's uh, building you up to the experience of being ready to, to go out uh, into this uh, brave new world aboard a starship, I think that's something that the adventure set can do really well by slowly taking you through the life path steps of character creation. Thank and, you and for slowly mentioning that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's. Yeah. I, I really like uh, Life Path as, as a way of uh, building your character. Yeah, just uh, so people know who might be listening for the first time, I want to add on this because I thought this was what this, you know, I get the privilege of being able to work on mission briefs sometimes. I'm like, oh my goodness, why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> um, for those who don't know um, how it works, he incorporated into the Starfleet Academy mission brief pack character creation so that you can start your cadet without all of the full rankings of a full officer. And as you go through each mission, you can add points in character creation until graduation. I thought that was brilliant. All right. I just wanted to explain that so people know why this is a way different type of Starfleet, uh, a way different type of mission brief set than that I've seen before. Yeah. Thank you. And mm -hmm. and yeah, it, like I say, it can still be used in the conventional way that you would expect to use mission briefs, but I'm really glad that you appreciated that that different angle in, in how you can use it. I, I, I really like life path character creation as, as a model for creating a character, uh, you know, taking you through the bits of a character's origin story in order to get there. I, I know it's something that has uh, roots and RPGs going back years and years to Traveler RPG and others. My first experience uh, of life path character creation in RPG was with the Smallville RPG, um, which I think is, a, again, a fantastic, very underrated RPG. And I, I loved that life path character creation. You were building up little relationship maps as you played. But the big problem I had with it is it could take you like two sessions just to do character creation <laughs> and all through that time you're like oh my god i love these characters i'm so excited for the story that we're building can we start playing the game now so life right. creation in star trek adventures I'm, I'm pleased to say is nowhere near that extensive um but if you have a group which are excited to start play as soon as possible and you're excited by the potential of life path character creation this is the way to have your cake and eat it. You know, well, drop them well, in with, with this set of mission briefs and see where it goes. Yeah, we get Jim's take on this too, because me and Jim have actually been talking about creation and play versus start with your character creation and then move in. And I, we've been we've been doing some playing on our own, some collaborative with Captain's Log. Jim, have you been swayed as to which... I, I prefer creation and play. That's just my thing. Um, and that's why when I saw the Starfleet Academy, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, exactly. Right. So, Jim, how do you feel about that? Uh, yeah, I'm 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 still open. I I, I love the idea. I mean, it really depends on what kind of campaign or game I'm getting into. I think if I was doing a full blown game like with a with a traditional game master and a group of players, I would probably do life path just because I want as much backstory about the character as possible heading into the campaign. But especially for Captain's Log, now that I'm working my way through the actual play of my first one anyway with Captain's Log, and I created the character using the full life path partly because I wanted to illustrate that to to prospective fans. But also I wanted to just kind of go through it and, and uh, see how the final result worked out. Um, I enjoyed it, but the more I think about Captain's Log and more I think about embracing the um, the 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 writer mindset, like the writer room mindset of discovering the character as you go, as you do mission to mission to mission, like just like what they do on the uh, the TV series. I'm really excited about that. Uh, so I think the next actual play I do, once I finish this mission for uh, the current actual play, I think I'll do another one where I use creation and play for the character and then just see what happens and see and see how that feels different because I'm confident it'll feel different. Um, but I really like the possibilities that creation and play brings because it it's it's less work for me to get into it, right? I can I can get a, I can make a character in 10 minutes instead of 45 minutes, which is kind of nice because like if you're crunched for time, then like the sooner we get to the game, let's go. <laughs> right um but uh I, i'm kind of uh open to it right now i think i think creation and play probably works better for star trek as we see it on 
on screen, right? And, I mean, partly because I've been channeling the um, the making of DS9, right? So, like, understanding how the writers' rooms and the producers create a story bible and and, and like a paragraph for each character, and and they have some ideas what the character is going to be in the pilot, right? But then they then they build on it episode after episode, and then they get the the actor feedback, and they get the writer feedback, and like the producers' feedback, and the fan feedback, and then it just kind of like evolves and grows so that the character by the end of the series is way different than what they were at the beginning. And of course, you want to see that, right? You want to see that character growth, and uh, I think maybe the fewer preconceived assumptions you have about that character going in the more open you are to growing and developing them and, and discovering new things about them. Right. So, um, yeah, that's well, a long one. Yeah. For you, Michael. No, it's no. And that's it because I'm telling you right now, Michael, like the, the first mission brief called applying yourself, which is for aspiring cadets. Uh, but Jim knows I've been vacillating next by the time we air this, I would have gone to Gen Con and been back, but I'm running tables for the very first time. I've never done a table before at a, at a con like this. And I was thinking about using applying yourself as the sit down one for people to use. I'm, I'm very, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm vast because it, um, for, again, I'm not going to, you know, ruin it again, but it's that first test. It kind of reminded me of the Wesley Crusher episode for Starfleet Academy. I very felt that vibe in there that you had in there when he was getting his test. And I was like, Ooh, this, this probably would be good for kids and adults. Like I really like having families play. Um, but to me, it would be like, Oh, it's okay. If you don't know anything, really, this is exactly why you're going to either pass the test or you're going to fail the test. And I'm thinking that at, if they have a good time with it, I'll be like, you know what? You can actually continue your, your person's story. Here's the free PDF. You know, that's kind of like my thing. So I don't know. I'm starting to lean toward their gym. I know I've been vacillating on what I'm actually going to run. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I mean, nothing wrong with that. I, I just think, um, uh, the Starfleet Academy mission briefs came out at just the perfect time. Uh, cause mm -hmm. I remember, you know, a few months ago, I mean, it's, it's been a while, but I remember, you know, Michael and Al, uh, Spader and some of the other writers and I were just kicking around the idea like how do we take the mission brief format and like not so much expand it, but just like change it up a bit because we've been doing it really well for a while now it's been working out really well like what other kind of nuances can we make to it that would make it uh, you know still within 10 pages that we can still give it away for free for the love of the fan but how can we just do something different with that with that basic format and uh, right about that time I think Michael you submitted the the pitch for for Starfleet Academy, like this this full blown like mini campaign almost, taking characters taking players through the um, you know through the life path as cadets, and I was like, oh, this really jives out really nicely because it's not just mission briefs; it's also there's some intentionality behind it, you know. And um, I think I think it worked out really well. And uh, what I didn't think about though, because because we were finalizing Captain's Log at the same time, what I didn't think about until until we were just about to release uh, Starfleet Academy is that this would work really, really well with captain's log because it's, it's 10 pre-made adventures. You like, there's not as much rolling on the random tables that you would need, right? You could, you just take those mission briefs and, um, and use that as your basis for your captain's log story. And instead of playing a captain, you're playing a cadet, right? So that, that saves you time on creating your character through the life path, but you can just go mission by mission by mission through that mission brief pack. And by the end of it, you've got a full blown character ready to go. Plus you've got 10 episodes worth of story uh, that you, that you can add to your, uh, to your wheelhouse there. So I was like, Oh, this, this all kind of like dovetailed really nicely. That, that, well, it's like, plus we lower decks. About it. What's that? Plus lower decks oh, coming yeah, out. Yeah, like yeah, yes, the, yeah. I saw, oh, this is ex like on top of the lower decks mission briefs, which are out. This one is just like lower decks galore. If you wanted to merge those, <laughs> you know, this with that campaign guide. And I, I wish, you know, I, I wish I could say we planned it because that would be <laughs> awesome. But uh, I have to be honest and transparent and say, you know, we we didn't, I, I did not specifically plan this in the schedule to say like, oh, we're going to release Captain's Log and we're going to release uh, Lower Decks and we're going to release this uh, Starfleet Academy, um, de um, you know, mission brief all at the same time. And it'll be perfect because, you know, I think in an ideal world, maybe that would have happened, but it's just how things worked out. And especially with, um, you know, I, I was talking um, before the show about how we have a lot of stuff in the uh, the review queue at Paramount. Um, they have so many of our manuscripts and our layouts in their review queue that literally we're releasing stuff just pretty much as it's approved and ready to go, right? And it just worked out that in that stack of 15 mission briefs slash standalones slash other digital products that we I sent to Paramount within that time window, Starfleet Academy was the first one to get fully approved, get fully laid out and be ready to go 
before other ones, right? I was like, okay, well, we're going with Starfleet Academy because I wanted to keep up with that monthly release schedule. So like, uh, you know, I did, I, I mean, we planned it to come out, but we didn't plan it to come out, you know, this month, <laughs> but it just yeah. worked, it just worked out. And I, I'm really happy that it did work out because it's uh, it's all making the fan feel like this is co- co- consistent and coherent. And just like you were saying, Michael, the the, connect, the interconnectivity between those three products is is pretty great. And I'm just excited to see what fans do with it and you know if you decide to run the first uh, brief at gen con all the better just make sure you take notes because i want to hear about okay. your uh about your <laughs> well, feedback well i was just thinking between lower decks and michael your you know this one starfleet academy and then i did the lower decks mission pack people have at least 30 to 40 games to play just focused on cadets and lower deckers i mean that's a year's worth of gaming right in addition michael i want to know what your fantasy is about because we know starfleet academy is going to be one of the shows that's going to be coming out from paramount so so do, do you ever think about that show what are you what are you looking forward to with it i do and like it, it wasn't something that i i tried to uh think about too much for for the product itself i wanted to be able to create something that uh, uh stood alone although it would be hilarious if i you know start watching the new show and start seeing <laughs> like missions <laughs> that we're really seeing it happen already on strange new world so that's okay there we go. <laughs> I mean, you know, what, what I was producing um, was something that was blending the the, the setting of Star Trek um, with uh, themes and, and 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 tropes and and familiar stories that you often see in stories about uh, adolescents and and young adults uh, in school and college, in uh, flight academies, in in other places of uh, learning. And I, I would expect and I would be excited to see similar stuff in the Starfleet Academy TV show because um, I think we're all obsessed with high school and, and our experiences of uh, uh, higher education and learning because there are times in your life where you learn so much so fast. You know, Jim was referencing earlier the idea of the the best characters that they don't emerge based on some preordained pre-written character backstory you've prepared for your character you find out who your character is by putting them in play letting bizarre things happen to them and see how they react to it sometimes in ways not even you choose sometimes in ways the dice decide for you Mm -hmm. um and that experience of being dropped into an unfamiliar situation where you don't feel like you're qualified or uh, wise enough to know how to respond to it properly and just trying to wing it that is for me the quintessential you know college experience right <laughs> so yeah. that that kind of uh, approach to star trek um very similar to, to to lower decks as you were describing earlier where you're not someone who has all the answers where you're not someone who has all the authority and all the power um you're experiencing some of this for the first time and you're having to to learn as you go that's what I want to see from a Starfleet Academy TV series. And that's what well, I tried to put these mission briefs. It's so funny because you compare it to university and, you know, education is supposed to be an enriching experience. And it's funny because I was thinking about the way your style of writing. And, and again, something we talk about a lot on continuing conversations is as a game master, your job is not to have them dungeon crawl in in this game if you want to that's fine again it's flexible for everyone who wants to pay but that's star trek universe is not just about dungeon crawling or collecting loot it's about enriching your character and um in each one of the briefs is like oh there's moral and ethical dilemmas there's philosophical dilemmas again going back to ghost rider that all of a sudden your group of characters are having these discussions without even rolling dice before you can even move into action. And, and I encourage people, I know it sets a good standard for me for when I have to write, um, but other game masters really get into the dilemmas uh, that, that in this case, you know, cadets would go through some of the moral growth and stuff like that. Cause when people walk away from the table with that painful character growth is the ones who want to keep coming back for more. And, and do you, when you, when you go into it again, asking one more question about your writing style, do you first, select the philosophical issue or like how do you what do you select first to cre- to create that uh inciting incident it's interesting because depending on what scenario I'm writing the, the, the initial inspiration can come from a number of places um jim was talking earlier about uh you know the importance of of getting inspiration from uh books and the news and and, and uh other tv shows and whatever 
for what you're going to be writing um, because it's all fuel, right? It's all fuel for the story that you're going to be producing. I think that's especially important for something like Star Trek because Star Trek at its best is always a, a commentary and contemporary uh, issues. Uh, and I, I think Star Trek is its weak, weakest when it becomes about Star Trek, when it becomes about regurgitating uh, existing parts of the, the, the media and the setting. So I think I do try and start from that starting point of, okay, what can I say about um, the people we are today or the historic relationship people have with education or the learning that people go through that they're at a certain age? You know, obviously there's a very diverse different plot threads that you're uh, trying to bring together into an idea. And I usually end up with more ideas that I can actually turn into my set of briefs. But then I look what works well here in combination or what are the stronger ideas? Um, and if I've got a lot left over, I'm one of the people that Jim was uh, worried about earlier, emailing him to be like, oh, I've got another idea for the thing I want to do. That's me. I'm, I'm the guy annoying the uh, project manager and producers with more ideas. Um, it will never be a, a, a problem of not having enough ideas when you get any group of RPG writers together. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I never run out of stuff. I, Jim, I, I think I may be first or second to bugging Jim about stuff, <laughs> just so you know. And uh, Jim, you can be honest. Is it me? Because I think I may be worse than Duxbury here. Uh, I'm not going to name names, Michael, but I'd say you're number two. Yes. <laughs> I'm Michael, Michael this week is number two. And then uh, and, uh, Michael Duxbury, you're within the top, you know, top 10, I think. Oh, I do. Cause you know, the thing is I'll just shoot out a quick, Hey, have you, but you know, what's amazing. I'll give you this and maybe Duxbury, you probably have the same issue going on. So many times I shoot an idea and he's already got it done. So, I mean, it's already on his whiteboard. I think he calls it his whiteboard, you know? So, so uh, that always impresses me. I get shot down a lot, but I, I at least have the satisfaction to know that it's being worked on. Yeah. It, it's got to be a good idea if, you know, it's already been an idea that someone has thought of. Yeah. I, mean, I think the that's, a, was... that's the real challenge with the Star Trek, right? Is that we're all working from the same, the same universe and we're all super creative and we all know, we're all gamers, right? So we all know what we want in our game table. And a lot of times that all kind of dovetails into the same ideas to where, you know, I might get, I might get emails or texts from two or three different writers saying, Hey, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. It's like, Oh yeah, we, we, we've, we've got that happening already. You know, somebody was ahead of you like a week or whatever, but uh, yeah, it's all good. Cause it's, it's all great ideas. I mean, in fact, uh, you know, if you watched the, uh, season two, episode six of um, Strange New Worlds, right? That episode is very similar to at least two of the standalone adventures that we've already published, right? There's there's a lot of story um, within that episode that was very reminiscent of both of those uh, adventures. And I, I wish, I wish I could know from the writing team on Strange mm -hmm. New Worlds, were they looking at our stuff and taking inspiration from it? Or is it just because the Star Trek, you know, creative collective unconscious is pulling the same ideas and the mm -hmm. same structure and stuff and, and like pulling up these ideas together to where to where their their end result was very similar to things that we already hit on you know a year or two years ago yeah we're all living in the same world as well exactly like, we're, we're all seeing the same news we're all responding yeah. to the same yeah. media and that's giving us all the same inspiration yeah i mean the the, the point uh of the you know uh, bizarre coincidence of the stuff that happened to come out of the review queue being Starfleet Academy and Captain's Log and Lower Deck all at the same time. I mean, on one hand, you know, that, that's that's an awesome coincidence and mm -hmm. any role players would know that sometimes acts of random chance can generate amazing plots better than Absolutely. any amount of planning ever can. That's why we use dice in our games, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I also just think there's probably been a lot of that kind of content that has all gone into the review queue at the same time, because what feels like a very hot idea right now is, well, maybe we don't want to read or play or watch stories about really high ranking people in positions of authority mm -hmm. telling us what to do and making decisions for the sake of all of us maybe yeah, yeah. Where, how we feel right now is that we are the scrappy underdogs and, and <laughs> everyone wants to wow. that action you said something profound you know we talk about how the pandemic affected you know even people wanting a solo rpg but i wonder if the pandemic's focus on the plights of frontline workers is what's really fueling the success of things like lower decks and starfleet academy I think it could be, or even just the experience of of being in lockdown and being separated from uh, our, our friends and our family, and the, the feeling of of powerlessness that that comes from that. Um, 
and in some cases, in, in some countries, that the inability of the people who are in positions of authority, who are supposed to be protecting us and helping us, and, and their powerlessness in the face of, of this hmm. global catastrophe, you know, the, the, the wish fulfillment of being in a position of relative powerlessness, but nonetheless able to make a difference, nonetheless able to make things better. Yeah, absolutely. I think people can resonate with, can uh, relate to that right now. That's so deep. <laughs> <laughs> deep enough to call it there, you think? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I have a, Michael, I, we're definitely going to be having you back on because I, I look forward to seeing more of your work come out. Um, I digest it with wonder again you're one of my favorite rpg writers so i really Thank appreciate you. having you here today we like doing gratitude so that's my start of gratitude here we'll we'll do a go around um i'm gonna of course always shout out the bricks and more brick and mortars um this time uh let's see i have a whole bunch here in the list let's go ahead and grab uh we have the crow's nest on Kauai. This is, of course, the state of Hawaii. Uh, Peter Simon shouts them out. And Daniel Swartz wanted to shout out Dragon's Lair Comics and Fantasy Games in San Antonio, Texas. So we're covering, I think, about like 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 miles of game store there. Um, so we really um, appreciate it from the smallest state in the U.S. and the biggest state in the U.S. I don't know, actually. Is Hawaii the smallest? No, Rhode Island's the smallest state. Rhode Island's the smallest. Oh, okay. Well, the island in a big, big mm -hmm. chunk of thing. So anyways, thank you to all those game stores who are uh, carrying on the tradition of role-playing games and selling those print copies and getting into people's hands for those visual tactile people. So thank you so much. All right, Michael, what's your gratitude? For sure. Uh, so following on from that for uh, brick and mortar stores, your friendly local gaming stores, which keep the hobby alive, and which we're all so grateful for. Uh, Leisure Games uh, in North London is a, a game store that I'm very fond of. Uh, haven't had an opportunity to go back to recently, but they do fantastic work. And if you are based in London or near London, definitely worth a, a pilgrimage uh, to, to see their collection of games that they've got there, because it's a really impressive collection of smaller story games as well as the uh, rpgs that you'll be familiar with um wow. so big shout out to them fantastic wouldn't it be wonderful jim if one day we had a show where we traveled the world going to game shops and interviewing owners and talking about like their favorite game and like introducing new games at every game shop we went to sure, that'd be amazing <laughs> I'm if putting you, in the universe. If you want to fund that, I'd be all for it. <laughs> oh, oh uh, we have to find a sponsor, uh, maybe A and E Arts and Entertainment there or something. Go. But that would be such an awesome show, traveling to all these game spots. <laughs> yeah. the and then we'd meet people like you. We'd come to London. And you'd tour us, Michael. It'd be like a cooking show, but for RPG. That'd be, awesome. right. yeah. <laughs> That'd be awesome. All right, Jim, take us out. Uh, yeah, I, I also want to thank all the brick and mortar stores. They are the the front line uh interface between fans and and game companies right so uh they provide space they provide opportunities to get product in front of people they 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 create communities all onto themselves um i'm super bitter because i don't have a friendly local game store near me uh so it's hard it's hard to get really excited about that uh so <laughs> i wish i had one um i do know when i travel on the odd occasions i travel i try to hit as many local game stores as possible just to see what's going on and just get, to get that vibe from them about what's happening in their in their particular meta and just to see what what are they playing besides magic and warhammer because i'm sure there's other games that they're playing but it's hard to tell sometimes but uh, we always try to see what's happening um i also want to thank all of the volunteers who work at all the different conventions all around the country all around the world um the volunteers that are often unsung but you're making efforts to uh make the the event a good experience for gamers and for companies that are there to uh you know to to interface with fans and to sell their wares so appreciation to all the volunteers at all the different conventions i mean in particular gen con which is coming up next week but there's conventions happening all around the world like every weekend um everywhere and it, it, i'm willing to bet that the vast majority of them are volunteer run and so the unsung heroes you volunteers thank you so much for all you do really appreciate it uh and then finally gratitude to the fans without the fans we wouldn't be doing this game after seven years we wouldn't have done captain's log so on and so forth um i am like i said earlier in the episode i am constantly inspired and uplifted by all the cool stuff you're doing with the game whether you're 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 bringing in new players or you're playing some new campaign and you're playing on a ship or, or station whatever um keep getting that stuff out there put it on your blog put it on your twitch put it on youtube like however you can share that story 
I am enjoying it, but everybody else is enjoying it. Like we're constantly getting new fans into the game and it's because of the fan base more than anything else. So thank you fans for being so supportive and such a strong um, grassroots, you know, builder of Star Trek Adventures because it's a it's a fantastic property and I'm grateful that I get to share it with so many people. So thank you all. Appreciate it. All right. So again, we continue the conversation as we keep pushing out Star Trek Adventures and Captain's Log information to make it easier for people to digest. Again, Michael Duxbury, our special guest today. Thank you so much. Thank Until you. next time, IDIC. Live long and prosper. Be safe. Be well. We'll talk to you all next time.